I want to extend a warm welcome to Drew Most. Thank you so much for joining us, Drew. I'm very happy to be part of the show. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of your discussion. Yeah, and so Drew is joining us all the way from Cameroon. And I want to start out by asking Drew to just tell us a little bit about himself, his journey, how he's gotten to this place in his life and Bible translation and all that good stuff. So go ahead, Drew. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I have a background in linguistics and biblical studies um, through university and doing an MDiv. Um, I've always just really loved languages and linguistics. Mm -hmm. I was known as the kid in high school who carried around a pocket Oxford dictionary. And that was really all I wanted for my birthday growing up was the latest edition of the Pocket Oxford. So I was that kid. Wow. I've just always been interested in language. Yeah. So um, working with Wycliffe, helping with Bible translation just seemed to be a natural fit. So all throughout um, my university years, um, I just thought through my studies, I thought, you know, I'll just kind of head this direction. And uh, my wife, Emily, and I, when we first looked at joining Wycliffe, we just thought, wow, if all of this comes together with raising support and going to language school and just everything that's required to move overseas and um, change your life dramatically, if all that comes together, then it will just be a miracle and it will just be a sign that we're kind of headed in the right Mm. direction. So we foolishly stepped out and it's been uh, kind of working ever since. Um, Our family motto, is getting it done while having fun. Mm -hmm. Um, I mentioned that to your listeners, um, that it's not yet copyrighted or trademarked. So I would (laughs) ask anybody who really likes it to proceed with caution. If I find it on t-shirts, that could (laughs) ruffle some feathers. But no, so that just kind of wraps up a little bit who we are. We have um, four children that are just growing up so fast. Um, We've been in Cameroon for um, seven years now, I believe. it took me a number of years to develop into a translation consultant. Um, I wouldn't have been able to do it without my mentor who just gave me loads of experience and just poured himself into me um, so that I could stand on his shoulders and do what I'm doing today, where now here in Cameroon, I work with three languages, um, assisting with both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Mm-hmm. Um, to help translators um, accomplish their goals for their translations in their communities. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so that's just kind of a brief overview. So let's back up just a little bit. Um, where are you from? Yeah, so I come from, uh, from America, United States of America. Um, I was born in Pennsylvania and then kind of grew up in West Virginia. So I call my mountain mama, mm-hmm. the one who brought me up. But um, when we go back to the States now, it's to, uh, to, it's to Pennsylvania. And so you naturally, being a, a Southerner, married a good old Southern gal, right? Well, not quite. No, the problem <laughs> was there I was, there I was at university happily doing my thing. And then this beautiful English gal rolled up on this sort of exchange study abroad Uh program. And um, she was very interesting to me. And so uh, this year we'll actually celebrate 15 years of marriage, which is quite exciting, which feels like, yeah, thank you. feels like quite a long time ago. Um, Mm -hmm. But no, she's from England. So we've kind of got this weird West Virginia, British thing going on. That's awesome. And your kids are are they are they getting a lot of the British accents still, or is that kind of on and off? Yeah, I think it depends um, largely on their their friends. So in the community where we're living now, it's mostly American friends. Yeah. But um, on a linguistic level, it's interesting hearing the kids' accents sort of shift. I mean, just to give you mm-hmm. an example. They, um, they're kind of bilingual when it comes to, um, to lexemes. So when it comes to uh, uh, words, they'll be bilingual. So you could, tell, you could tell one of the children, oh, their mother could tell them, oh, go, go get me a torch. Mm-hmm. And, and they would go get a flashlight. Or if I say, go get me a flashlight, they would go get a flashlight. So they're, they're <laughs> able to do that sort of thing. Um, but there have been a couple really funny things. I mean, just recently, our daughter started calling the trash the trash, the trash. So, which of course is very funny because in England they don't call it trash nor 
trash. They just call it the bin. So she, <laughs> here she was trying to apply a sort of British English accent to an Americanism. <laughs> uh, and then what was the other? There was another example where um, one of them was saying pants, like pants. Oh. Um, but of course, but of course, in England, you yep. they're called trousers, and then your pants are your undergarments. But they were, you know, so this sort of <laughs> sort of over over compensation, or I don't know, I don't know what the ling proper linguistic term would be. But um, the the way their minds work. Is just amazing, and one of our uh, one of our daughters thought for the longest time that the word "amen" was actually "our men." She would pronounce it "our men" because she would oh. hear her mother say "amen," and oh. this is just fascinating the way children's brains work. But she was so used to the British English accent dropping an "r" post yeah. post vocalically, like "car," "car," yeah. that she inserted an "r" into the word "amen." Oh, that's uh, so fascinating! We had, we, isn't that isn't that crazy? You know, no, but she never heard anyone say "our men." Mm -hmm. But her brain noticed that hey, where mommy doesn't say an "r" after a <laughs> vowel, daddy sometimes does, and of course, this child doesn't know what a vowel is, so it, it's just fascinating. Right, right. Wow. Okay. Cool. So, uh, for those of you who are listening in, I actually first time I met Drew. I was getting off the plane in Cameroon. I had just been on my first flight into the heart of Africa. I had no idea what I was doing. It was my first time to Africa, and I was moving there. And uh, he and his wife and his two kids at the time were kind enough to do the airport run for me and waited a long time because my flight was delayed. And so that was my first uh First time meeting you, and that was seven years ago. So crazy. Yeah, I can still picture you. I can still picture you walking out of the Yaoundé airport carrying yeah. a guitar case. Yeah, probably in a daze. And yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was not a great first uh, airport landing. But anyway, oh. so uh, let's, let's get back to your story. So you went to seminary. Uh, which yes. seminary? I went to Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. It's one of the Southern Baptist seminaries. It's located in um, the town of Wake Forest in North Carolina. Okay. So when you went there, what was your intention at the time? Were you thinking pastoring? Were you thinking other things? Or was it always Bible translation? It was always geared towards Bible translation. So even there at Southeastern, I took... Um, as many language courses as I possibly could. And it just so happened that while I was there, um, I was able to take Greek, like most seminarians will, as well as Hebrew. But then mm -hmm. at the time, it just so worked out that we had a professor there at the time who taught both Aramaic and Syriac. Now, I mean, wow. of course, Aramaic and Syriac are pretty close, but we got to practice reading and writing um, using the different Syriac alphabets. Um, yeah. So fortunately, I've been able to have a little bit of Aramaic as well, in addition to the Hebrew. Um, nice. And it just it feels really fortuitous the way God kind of arranged all that, because uh, mm -hmm. being here in Cameroon, I've actually had a chance now to work um, in both Daniel and Ezra, and nice. try, uh, applying that Aramaic a little bit. Yeah. So at Southeastern, I did there uh, the MDiv, the Advanced Biblical Studies, which is Mm -hmm. just uh, 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 mainly focused on the biblical languages. Um, in hindsight, cool. would I have done the MDiv knowing what I do now? Um, I often ask myself that, but I'm very grateful for the perspective and mm -hmm. the breadth of the education that I received, both in theology and church history. Um, and I guess I, I want to kind of touch on this a little bit later. Um, yeah. Just the role of a consultant as standing in a long line of interpreters of the Bible, I think it's very important that we gain as much historical perspective um, as possible so that we yeah. can help bring that to the table. So while some of the courses may have been less um, geared towards or less um, um, necessary for somebody wanting to become a consultant now, I, I'm still very grateful for the wonderful education I received there at Southeastern and um, 
it was an overall very good experience and I was able to get the um, advanced exegesis and language courses there that have really equipped me and further developed my love for the biblical languages. That's wonderful. So you're headed towards Bible translation. How did your wife feel about that? My wife said, well, if we're going to go to the mission field and you're going to do Bible translation, then I should probably do something practical. I don't mm -hmm. think she was implying that Bible translation isn't practical, but um, right. she wanted to do something a bit more hands-on, not really feeling um, led towards the sort of linguistic um, side of things. Um, so she studied to become a nurse, a registered nurse, and awesome. her skills... Her skills of a nurse have proved invaluable, um, both as a mother and a member of the community, just being able to um, respond to those needs as well. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So let's jump in a little bit to your time, a little more detail into your time in Cameroon. So you, you first had to learn French, um, and that was in France or in Switzerland? France. Yeah, we okay. spent um, a year in France. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, tell us like a little overview of the process to working into or growing into becoming a full-fledged consultant when you arrived. So the process to become a consultant um, over the last number of years has become increasingly well-defined such that mm -hmm. anyone who would be interested in becoming a consultant now, um, once they got connected to the right people within the, our family of organizations, they should be able to receive a somewhat clear roadmap for how to be a consultant or um, how to develop in this capacity. And that's what I followed as well was a growth plan for becoming a translation consultant that included everything from local language and culture learning mm -hmm. to study in the biblical languages, studies in linguistics, and um, what else? And then there's interpersonal, the interpersonal side of things. And of course, anybody who might come abroad with a sending organization like Wycliffe will hopefully already come to the field with a certain amount of training already. I mean, you certainly don't want to come yeah. to the field and just think, okay, I'm here. God's going to just use me to do whatever if you don't have any sort of training. So what I try to encourage people to do now is to go as far as you can in your studies while mm -hmm. you're in your home country as possible so that you're best equipped to serve uh, most effectively or however it will, knowing that you're going to continue to learn once you're on the field. So right. I came already with a biblical studies background and a linguistic background. But of course, what I was most lacking and still to this day, I would say I'm very lacking in, and that is experience and familiarity with a variety of local language and local culture. Mm -hmm. And there is the, there arises the importance of um, coming abroad, experiencing another culture, experiencing another language, uh, stepping outside of one's home and, and feeling what it's like to be home um, among another people. So that's, that's an integral part of that growth plan. And I yeah. found that very helpful. You know, it gives people a very clear target for, okay, if you want to work in a capacity, in the capacity of a translation consultant, you know, you need to focus on these areas. Um, again, I was very fortunate to have a very experienced mentor who had been here for almost 20 years. Um, mm -hmm. by the time he finally retired, um, so he was able to share a lot of things with me that in the past you just had to learn the hard way. So I'm, I'm, I'm still continually grateful for sure. um, the way he poured himself into me. But yeah, that was basically it. Just having the this growth plan as a roadmap to kind of know, okay, here are the boxes I need to tick. Um, it's also important to note that it's not just, just about ticking boxes, but it's about showing competency in different areas. So one of the key areas where the growth plan for a translation consultant, at least in uh, French speaking Africa is concerned, one of the key areas is demonstrating a knowledge of discourse linguistics or text linguistics or uh -huh. linguistics at the larger, broader discourse level. Uh -huh. And so for that, I actually had to sit down and be interviewed 
by, it felt more like an interrogation by a linguistics consultant and just kind of drilled on, okay, just tell me what you know about this and this. And, mm. and we just walked through, I, mean, I can't remember how long we spent together, but wow. that, was, that was a way that I was able to demonstrate that uh, competency rather right. than just saying, rather than just saying, oh, I took a discourse analysis class at such mm -hmm. and such institution, you know, tick the box. But where it actually matters is, can you apply that knowledge? Can you demonstrate a certain level of learning in that right. area? Right. So tell us a little bit about your mentor, if you can, um, what kinds of things he did with you specifically uh, to help you grow into that role and, uh, you know, what, what things particularly about him that you appreciated the most, that sort of stuff. Sure. Yeah. Uh, my mentor is uh, Dr. Tony Smith, a, a British gentleman who had lived in, who lived at the time in Cameroon with his family. Mm -hmm. um, they were a family that approached Bible translation much along traditional lines of one family, one missionary family going to one language community, mm. um, settling down there, learning that language, mm -hmm. and being an integral part from the beginning to the end of seeing the New Testament published. I actually mm. had the honor of attending um, the New Testament dedication for his language, for awesome. that language, um, shortly after we arrived in Cameroon. I think it was the same year we arrived. I was mm. able to attend that dedication. Um, so they, wow. they very much did it along the lines of how I imagine many people think of Wycliffe even today is yeah. that there's, there's, um, Western folks who've moved from their home country. They settle down in a village. They've learned the language doing most of the work. Now, yep. of course, the way that, um, my role or the way Bible translation has changed, at least in the region where I work is I'm now based in the capital working with teams, sometimes remotely, sometimes in the capital, but I'm working with three teams rather than one. Um, I did language and culture learning in a language of the same cluster of languages with which I now work, mm. um, but I don't work with that specific language. So the thinking was, um, it may be just as helpful to apply oneself to learning a related language um, right. to then assist related languages. Um, yep. especially given that my role is not one of a translator. So I'm not, for all the languages I'm working with, I'm not the translator. I'm more like um, a facilitator, if you will, or a translation consultant. I mean, there's all sorts of metaphors you can use to describe a translation consultant. My, the, my favorite one is actually a chef. Um, that's kind of a, a long... Um, uh, oh. A, a long kind of side story. I want to tell at some point if, if we have the time, but let's, let's, let's um, do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Should we do it? Yeah. I've since, you know, since coming to Cameroon, I kind of sensed that, um, there's a lot of presuppositions on, uh, Bible translation practitioners concerning both the kinds of translations we should be aiming for and what the role of everybody is in achieving that translation. So what mm -hmm. I mean is, um, it seems that in the past, at least, I mean, this is my impression that in the past, everybody working within Bible translation kind of assumed that everybody would want a certain type of translation. Uh huh. And that the translation consultant's role would be one of perhaps making decisions for teams or kind of, I, I don't know exactly, but one more of a hands-on approach um, one more of somebody in charge, directing a team, guiding a team who might not have the capacity necessary to perhaps make decisions for themselves or, or mm. something like that. Now, I'm just generalizing. I'm just characterizing and more sure. experienced translation consultants may hear what I'm saying and they say, oh, no, 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 we never did it like that. Well, th this is just kind of my impression. So the yeah, way I can totally I can totally see how when people hear the consultant in general, like the word consultant they would think along those lines, the, the guy who has all the answers kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. So go and ahead. Kind of, kind of the decision maker. And so um, the way I've tried to position myself as a translation consultant is foremost as a servant. But then secondly, I found very helpful the metaphor of a chef. Um, hmm. If you think about a professional kitchen, 
mm-hmm. at one of these, you know, like super fancy restaurants that I never go to, you know, <laughs> or if you've seen the movie Ratatouille, maybe there we yeah. go, everybody, yeah. you know, if you've seen the movie Ratatouille, right, there's um, a clear, strict hierarchy of these different chefs in a kitchen. Mm. And um, I mean, this is called the brigade system in French. And there's mm. the, sometimes there's the executive chef and then under him or her, there's the, the head chef. But then they have this role called a sous chef is somebody who's under the chef, sous in mm. French meaning under. And then under the sous chef, there are chef de partie. So there are um, chefs who are assigned to very specific tasks who are, specialists either in frying things or making sauces or grilling things or making Mm. pastries. So they've specialized in that area. So in thinking about the servant like role of a consultant, I try to position myself as sort of a sous chef or one of these chef de partie, um, meaning that I don't want to be the final decision maker on decisions that are made for a Bible translation um, for a given community. Right. So I like to think about Bible translation in terms of a given language community preparing a feast for their Mm. own people. And so the feast, the food being the word of God in this case. Uh, Now, I as an outsider, I as a translation consultant, I cannot eat their food. Mm -hmm. God did not give it to me to be born on their mountain in their region, whatever. You know, I may learn their language a little bit, but that is ultimately food that they're preparing for themselves. And this became clear to me when I was working on the gospel of Luke with a translation team. And at one, one of these times where a pass, you see a passage really sink in with translators and this older gentleman, he kind of stopped us after doing, I can't remember which verse it was in Luke, but he stopped and he said, you know what? You are working in our fields, but Mm. you will not reap the harvest. Mm. You are helping us prepare a meal that you will not eat. Yeah. And that, that has really stayed with me. Um, and so now I like to think of my role as one, as one of these, uh, a sous chef or a chef de partie who brings a certain speciality to the table, hopefully. Maybe that's a knowledge of linguistics or a knowledge of biblical studies or a knowledge of translation studies. And hopefully for a translation consultant, you have a working understanding of all three of those that you can bring together and bring to the table to contribute. Mm -hmm. Um, So I find it helpful to think of the translation process like preparing a meal. Sure. There's a science to it. You know, we're using human language, follow certain rules generally. And, you know, you, you make sounds with your mouth and then you, you reproduce those on paper. And, you know, that's like when, when baking bread, you know, there's a science to the way yeast works. You know, you yeah. add sugar, you add warm water, you have to activate it, and there's a science to it. But there's also a creativity to it. I mean, just go into a bakery and you'll see all the different ways that bread has been prepared. Yeah. Um, and so there's a science, but there's also creativity required. And we know that ultimately a meal is prepared to be eaten and enjoyed. Mm-hmm. And my impression, or perhaps my fear, is that in the past, the ones cooking, weren't the ones who were ultimately eating. And what I mean by that is not to say that anybody um, did their work half-heartedly or had the wrong motive or anything. You know, I'm just trying to look back on the way that translation was done in past decades and previous generations, people for whom I'm eternally grateful. But if we just take a moment to kind of look back on that, if I position myself as the main translator for somebody else, Mm -hmm. I'm ultimately preparing a meal for them that I'm not really going to eat. And I'm kind of assuming that I'm making it for myself. And so now as a consultant, being as in a role of kind of a quality control person, I never want to assume that when I'm using my consultant skills and helping translators check their translations, I don't want to assume that that in itself is enjoying the meal. Yeah. But what I'm doing is offering expertise, hopefully, to help them prepare a better meal for their community. So my focus is to work alongside translators to help them prepare a meal that will meet the goals Mm -hmm. that they've set for their feast that they want to have with their community. I mean, if you just think about it like a steak, right? You go into a restaurant and there's all these different ways to cook a steak. Um, And if I, the consultant, 
imagine that I want to help somebody cook a steak. You know, if I want to help my daughter, for example, cook a steak or anybody cook a steak, Mm -hmm. you know, you would tell them, you would say, Hey, listen, how do you want your steak done? And if they say, well, I want it rare. Well, then you know Uh that that steak needs to stay on the grill for what, three to five minutes. And then you need to flip it. Uh Now, if I'm, if I'm kind of a sous chef, if I'm not the one in charge and I'm trying to help somebody prepare that steak, how they want it. If I see them leaving that steak on the grill for say six, seven minutes, I'm just going to kind of nudge them and say, Hey, you know, you said you wanted this kind of, um, you wanted your steak prepared this way, but Hey, we're kind of going past that. You might consider flipping it or taking off, taking it off the grill. If you yep. still want to get the right level of, of, uh, cuisson for your steak. And exactly. so in that way, that's how I kind of picture what we're doing as translation consultants, not necessarily telling somebody how to cook their steak or how they should prepare their steak, but rather being in dialogue and saying, well, how do you want this prepared and what are your goals for this feast? Mm -hmm. And then coming alongside offering expertise like that chef de partie and Mm -hmm. giving, giving advice and not assuming that my check, my consultant check is the final thing. I'm not enjoying the meal. Um, I want, I want to help them cook the meal to their liking um, because it's ultimately their taste buds that Mm -hmm. the meal must please. Yeah. Um, but there again, we come back to the idea of a consultant as well, being a representative of a long line of interpreters of the Bible. So I also want to represent that perspective as well. And so if I see them, you know, put their steak on the grill and just cook it for say five seconds on both sides, I can say, you know what, in the long tradition of cooking steaks, you know, if you cook it just five seconds on both sides, you might get ill. So yeah. I can kind of bring that perspective and say, hey, you know what? You might consider it, you might yep. consider cooking in a different way, um, trying to nudge them back into the, if you will, the broad uh, guardrails of steak acceptability. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Does, that, does that make a little bit of sense? That sort of metaphor as a chef and cooking? Yeah, and and- yeah absolutely. That's a brilliant metaphor. And I'm sad that I hadn't heard it until now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but this is why I'm doing this because... Uh, you know, having these kinds of conversations with other consultants, I think broadens everybody's horizon and uh, that's what we want. Right. So this is great. This is great. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I'm just waiting for you to come out with the consultant as guitar player metaphor or perhaps (laughs) the consultant as, uh, I mean, just, just insert any one of your numerous skills. Right. You'll be sure to have an even better, better metaphor (laughs) than the chef. I'll have to think about it. So let's get into, if you will, um, if you're ready to, let's, let's transition to some specific examples from your work, either recently or in the past that you wanted to highlight, uh, give us a in-depth view of, uh, the nitty gritty, you know, translation consultant life, uh, particular verses, all that. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Um, over the last year, for example, I was just looking at a list of all the books I've l- worked in with teams and mm-hmm. it really represents a broad, um, uh, a spectrum of genre and everything you find in the Bible. So, yeah. um, last year, this time I was working on Romans and then mm-hmm. shortly thereafter I was working on Exodus and by working on, I mean, working alongside translators. So translators have prepared their draft of a given book in their language. They've tested it with their community. They've gotten feedback from their community. And when they think it's ready for um, a finer exegetical check, then they'll bring it to me and I'll help them work through any uh, remaining issues. And I'll check it verse by verse to make sure that it's kind of within the broad bounds of acceptability, that it's kind of clear, it's natural, um, Mm -hmm. all these sort of things that it kind of corresponds to what we're trying to translate. So that's what I mean by working with. So some of the books that I've done that with are just recently, I mean, within the last year, Romans, Exodus, um, Joshua, first and second Corinthians, Numbers, um, the pastoral epistles, Philippians, Mm. Leviticus. I just finished Leviticus last week last uh friday um ephesians james jude esther jonah and daniel it's okay. just kind of every, yeah so probably some of my favorite um 
memorable work done within this kind of last year. I have a, a little list here. Mm -hmm. um, probably one of the most satisfying things that's happened is the way that I have helped one team meet their goals for the adaptation of proper names. Hmm. Um, now this might, you know, when we think about the nitty gritty of Bible translation, you know, we think of big issues like how are you going to translate righteousness or how are you going to translate, um, yeah. you know, is it the faithfulness of Christ or is it faith in Christ? You know, this, these big debates, you know, like new perspective type stuff, but uh -huh. really things that, uh, things that have the most impact on community. Sometimes it's in the most surprising places. And I was really surprised by the way that um, the impact that the adaptation on proper names has had in one community in particular. So mm. what I mean by that is um, I noticed that one of these Old Testament teams that I'm working with, that their phonology matches pretty closely with what we imagine to be biblical Hebrew phonology. Nice. Um, but these translators... Um, having, having never studied biblical Hebrew, they were a bit at a loss to access biblical Hebrew phonology as, yeah. as most of us are. Yep. Um, and so having looked at their language, I said, well, why aren't you guys using your glottal stop? Why aren't you guys using your pharyngeals? Why aren't you guys using, um, your Sade like Africa? Why aren't you guys using it? And they're like, well, should we? Wow. The problem was they were, they were, uh, filtering they were using versions of the Bible that they had access to, as we all do, to yeah. adapt proper names. But those proper names being filtered through these other languages was, of course, filtering out phonemes that they have in common with biblical Hebrew. So, for example, they have an affricate like Sade, mm -hmm. and they, they weren't using it. And I said, well, well, hey, guys, what would you think about using this? So here again, uh, positioning myself as a servant, not saying, hey, you've got to use this, or you've got to use that, or you've got to use that, sure. just saying, hey, have you thought about cooking your steak this way? Mm -hmm. And um, it turned out that they tested a few proper names like that, and they just loved it. So they're now, now in the process of um, adapting all the proper names um, in their Bible to kind of match biblical Hebrew. And so what I do for that, because, um, cause I'm, I'm not as strong in Hebrew as the cases are with your wonderful communicative Hebrew videos. <laughs> yes. Go to you, YouTube right now and watch all of them. They're amazing. Um, it's, it's amazing what you can do case. with special effects on, when it's a video, you <laughs> just edit uh, all the mistakes. So yeah, you're probably <laughs> way more advanced. Oh. Oh, come on. What mistakes? Um, <laughs> so what I actually do for the translators is I have Randy Booth's pronunciations of, uh, uh, I think it's pretty much every Hebrew word that, that appears in the Hebrew Bible. You can get that in Logos. Um, and so I just play the sound file for them. So we get to Nebuchadnezzar and I just hit play and Randy Booth pronounces it, you know, nice and loud on this Bluetooth speaker in my office. Uh, and I let them filter it through their, mm -hmm, their ears, mm -hmm. you know, they don't, they're, they're hearing it and then they know, and it's just amazing to see, you know, they have a, a schwa um, that they use and it's just amazing to see them hear it. Things that I don't necessarily hear, you know, like a pharyngeal or a glottal mm -hmm. stop or those sort of things. They hear it and they write it, you know, better than I could ever do. Um, but it makes sense because that's the language that they, one speaks on their mountain. Um, so that's what I'm doing wow. with them at the moment. And they've had some really good results. Um, and it was hilarious. We finished checking the book of numbers, which of course has all these different proper names. Yeah. And when we got done with it, they were like, oh, you know what we need to do? I said, well, yeah, what do we want? What do we want to do? You guys want to publish this book straight away? You know, like, you know, like, did you find something really meaty theologically? And they're like, no, we need to print just a list of the proper names in this book. I was like, what? And they said, yeah, <laughs> we want to print a list and pass it out. So people who are having babies, they can name their kids some of these <laughs> awesome names. Some of these awesome names we found That's in the book great. of numbers. And uh, it was hilarious because while they were listening to the sound files and adapting the proper names, there'd be some times where they'd go, oh, wow, that sounds like a real name in our language. And I'm like, wow, okay. Uh, so that's what they wanted to do, you know, and that's just one of those, the, you never would have guessed. I never would have imagined in no way. years that, that that's an application of having the book of numbers in your language is that, you know, they've started to feel like, wow, this, 
is our language. Like this is in our language. You are speaking our language. These are our phonemes. This is, this is, this sounds like us and we want our kids to be called this. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's so cool. So is this an Anglophone group or a Francophone group? Um, Francophone group, but their okay. language, their local language is, their local language is part of the Afroasiatic family. Okay. So they're in a Chadic branch of Afroasiatic. Now, um, mm. Hebrew and, yeah, yeah. you know, Arabic and other, you know, so these language, their language is actually, I don't know, I don't know if you want to say a cousin, but it's actually in the same broader linguistic family. Mm -hmm. as Hebrew. So it's not totally unsurprising. Uh, it's not totally surprising that they would have a similar um, phonology. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. All right. Well, if all the, the other highlights are as good as this one, keep going. Nah, well, no, that, that's one of my favorite just because it's so <laughs> curious. But um, I, I did just want to mention what I find to be one of the hardest um, questions that I get as a consultant. And maybe you've experienced this as well. It's okay. when people ask me questions that it doesn't seem like a biblical text is trying to answer or address. Mm. Have you experienced that? Yep. So for example, just, uh, was it last month? I was working on the book of Esther and um, we were in Esther chapter one, verse 11. And it says on the seventh day, when the king was feeling good from the wine, he commanded so and so and so and so and so and so the seven eunuchs who personally served him. He commanded these guys to bring Queen Vashti before him with her royal crown. Right. Now, that sounds more or less easy to translate, doesn't it? But the yep. question that the translators asked me, they said, well, where was Vashti at the time? Where uh, is the king at the time? Mm -hmm. Where is the narrator? Mm. And does Queen Vashti have to go up? in elevation or down in elevation to get to him. And wow. the reason that they, the, the reason they asked all this is because their verbs have infixes. So if you're making somebody go from one location to another, they have infixes that they have to say whether it's um, really far away, kind of far away, sort of far away, whether it's from from low to high in elevation or from high to low in elevation. So all this no gets way. All this gets packed into their verbs. And so they're asking me, they're like, well, we'd love to say that um, the king is asking people to bring Vashti before him, but the form of the verb is going to change based on where she is, where he is, and where the narrator is. And of course, dealing with a, with a book like Esther, yeah, I mean, trying to figure out, okay, who's the narrator? Where's the narrator? Yeah. I mean, these, are, these are questions that, how could you even begin to answer them? So right. it, it's kind of... Um, cheeky on my end but normally what i do in these situations we look at the context and try to answer these questions as best we can based on the context but then mm -hmm. when it comes to things like where's the narrator i just say well what do you guys think yeah like, does she have to go up or down or whatever you know, like <laughs> how do you guys how does your mental model when you guys think about in your mind how have you constructed this story in your mind yeah do you think she's going up, up in elevation or down and they're like yeah she's probably going like a medium distance up and down and whatever blah 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 and I'm like, okay, that, that sounds reasonable. I mean, as long as it's not obviously contradicting scripture or anything in the context, they have to make decisions that otherwise the biblical text isn't obligated to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, that, was, that was something that was cool that came out in the oral drafting workshop that I went to in Dallas, where one of the techniques is you, you internalize the text by acting it out as a team. And so when you have to act out something in a little mini drama, these kinds of details start coming up because you have mm. to, you have to place somebody in somewhere, you know, yes, in the scene yes. and like, where, where is he going to come from? Where is he going to enter the scene from? Mm. Uh, what, what is it, the expression on his face going to be like all of those little details mm. that aren't in the text, but when you do bring it to life, you have to, imagine so it's kind of similar to that kind of that kind mm. of dilemma yeah so cool so what yeah, was their right. their conclusion yeah. 
Um, I don't know. I would have to look back. I can't remember okay. yeah, exactly yeah. what they said, but it was something that sounded reasonable and fit with the context of everything. So we, uh, we went with it. I mean, ultimately, I don't know, you know, I don't know how far did Vashti have to go to get, I mean, it's, it's <laughs> sort of funny asking these kinds of questions about a book like Esther, but right. Um, right. <laughs> all right. If you want, we could move on to something in Exodus. That's kind of interesting. Sounds great. Yeah. Um, now this again, you know, coming back to the idea of a consultant as standing as well, standing in a long line of biblical interpreters, but also being part of the church. Yeah. Um, I think that's important to see as well, is that we're part of the church and I want to exactly. always be in dialogue with people of faith and the people of God. So mm-hmm. um and, and this long line of interpreters. So when I'm working on the Old Testament, I don't know if you do this as well when you're working on the Old Testament, but I always like to have um, the Septuagint accessible to me. Yeah. Uh, I always like to have, I've started working with Targumim as well. Of course, English translations of Targumim. So it's, oh, I'm kind okay. of filtering it through a different I do not do that. Later, but, okay. Well, the reason it came to me was um, when I started working on the book of Numbers a while back, I was reading an annotated bibliography by such and such professor on the book of Numbers. And he said, if you're studying Numbers, you've absolutely got to interact with Targum. Targum, I can't remember, was it Targum Onkelos maybe? He said, you've absolutely got to read Targum Onkelos. And hmm. fortunately in Bible works, I had um, an English translation. I was like, well, let me just keep it out, keep it open and, and yeah. we'll see how it goes. But it's been really helpful and I like it for kind of helping me understand where traditionally the guardrails, if you will, have hmm. the interpretive guardrails, if you will, have been on some of these Old Testament passages. But if you look at a passage like Exodus 11.2, now, here again, I don't think this passage, how you translate, would necessarily jeopardize anyone's salvation, but uh-huh. it, it, it's very interesting. Um, the Okay, so Exodus 11, 2. Okay. Um, so I'm just looking at some newer translations here. So one sure. of the newer translations in English is the Christian Standard Bible, which I think yeah. was published just a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And Exodus 11, 2, they say, now announce to the people. So this is what, this is the 10th plague and the Israelites are supposed to pillage their neighbors or whatever. Uh Um, So Christian Standard Bible says, now announce to the people. So it's the announce that that interests me. Okay. Um, Another recent version is the Bible for everyone. Have you seen this one with John Golden Gay and Tom Wright? Uh, Yeah. 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 So here, John Golden Gay translates this as speak in the ears of the people. Uh-huh. Now, this, the speak in the ears of the people is a rather um, word-for-word literal translation of the Hebrew there because it says, mm-hmm. I mean, you'll see, speak in the ears of the people. So the question then becomes, how do you understand speak in the ears of the people? Yeah. And so while I was working with um, uh, a translation team, checking their draft of Exodus, I've always got the Hebrew text out before me, and they were they were... Uh, telling me what their version says in Exodus 11 too. And I was just really, you know, anytime the Hebrew text seems to really vary from what somebody says, you just start to ask questions. And so um, I said, well, hey, you know, like this in Hebrew here, it says speak in the ears of the people. And they said, well, yeah, but we don't see that in, in many of the versions that they had before them. And even if you look at a lot of English versions, like the NRSV, for example, it just says, tell the people, you uh-huh. know, there's no ears there's just kind of implied yeah. or just yeah. seem to be perhaps an idiomatic expression for telling something to someone. So I, I asked him, I said, well, given the context, the, this expression, does this expression speak in the ears of the people? What do you think that could mean in the context? And does that mean anything to you speak in the ears of the people? And they said, well, actually in our language, this is still that same uh, Chadic Afroasiatic language. They said, well, actually in our language, when you speak in the ears of somebody, it means to speak secretly. You're, yeah. you're not, you're not announcing it. Hmm. You're, you're saying it, you're kind of passing it um, yeah, person yeah. to person. You know, this person would kind of say it in their ear and then they pass around. And that, I don't know, that kind of makes sense in the context. You know, are you really going to stand out and publicly say, all right, everybody go pillage your neighbors. Or are you right. just going to kind of pass it around secretly like, hey, you know, like we're uh-huh. going to go around and we're going to take their gold, blah, blah, blah. So uh-huh. that was really interesting. And it was at this time that I then, you know, after asking them this question, I was like, wow, that's really intriguing. Mm-hmm. I then looked at what the Septuagint said. And for the Septuagint, I often rely on the uh, Nets translation, you know, the yeah, New yeah. English 
translation of the Septuagint. So I just looked at what it said, and of course I've got the Greek of the uh, Septuagint there before me as well. And uh, Nets says, speak then secretly to the ah, ears of the people. Very and nice. I thought, wow, okay. Well, they've kind of double translated, haven't they? In the Septuagint translators have said right, secretly right. to the ears, which mm -hmm. I would take as a double translation, meaning where the Hebrew text just says in the ears, they've translated it twice, first secretly, secondly in the ears. So yep. they preserve kind of both. Yep. Um, and I pointed this out to the, to the translator said, hey, you know that the Septuagint translators millennia ago translated it kind of like you guys are telling me now, what do you think about that? And they said, wow, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, <laughs> the most fascinating aspect of the whole thing is in their language, they could just say, I think they ended up saying, um, speak in the ears of the people. So they sort of literally translated the Hebrew, speak in the ears of the people, and it kind of implies the meaning that you find in the Septuagint. That's um, really cool. So, so here's where I like to be in dialogue with interpreters that have gone before me. And I don't know, yeah. what do you think, Andrew? Do you find that to be an acceptable translation solution in this case? Absolutely. And I have many examples like that that came out in this past year when I was doing this um, these Old Testament translations with the Fang in Equatorial Guinea. Mm. I don't know if I told you about this, but uh, I, I wrote up a whole paper. I have a whole list of of different ways that the language and the culture mapped onto Hebrew language and culture like extraordinarily. Mm. Mm. And they were able to say things that we can't say in English translations or in Spanish translations that the Hebrew can say really easily. And uh, mm. so it was, it was remarkable. It, it was actually super interesting because the Fong have a tradition or a legend that they came from Egypt. Come on. Yeah. Oh, that's wow. what they say. That's what everyone says. So they, ah. they, they say that they came from, and, and the more I, I, I worked with them on this, the more I believed it because yeah, it they had so many of these similarities like you're talking about where you're like, oh, well, if I just tell you what it says in Hebrew, then you're like, oh, okay, I can say that much <laughs> more easily than the Spanish translation tells me to say it, you know? Yes. Wow. So, yeah, it was really cool. Uh, oh, cool. I got a whole list of them and really uncanny, especially the cultural things that mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. so easy for them to understand compared to mm. Western culture, mm. you know, issues of uh, the bride price and polygamy and all these things that to them are really today even are just straight normal. It's not a stumbling block. Like mm. these weird things that happen in Genesis, they're like, Oh yeah, of course we'd do that. You know, even Abraham, lying to these different kings about his wife being his sister uh the translator was like yeah of course we'd do that <laughs> <laughs> it's like a, wow. a natural thing it was it was almost just a, a cultural norm um that happens today still wow. so anyway uh back to you though go ahead yeah so no sure. I mean, in some more uh, more of these examples yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so there's just another example kind of following in the same line of thinking here. Um, Exodus 1.16 was another example of that, um, where, for example, the Bible for everyone, again, John Golden Gay, he says, uh, this is, of course, the Hebrew uh, midwives um, who are supposed to assist with the births. Ah, the birth of, of little boys. And so right. 1.16 says, when you're delivering the Hebrew women, Look mm -hmm. at the stones. Mm -hmm, and exactly. if, my, if my memory serves me well, I think the Hebrew there is the dual form of stones. I think so. so. It's like, look at the two stones, right? Um, yep. The common English Bible, um, a newer English translation that we like to use in our family for our sort of family worship and reading the Bible together as a family with, with the kids. Um, uh -huh. The common English Bible says, when you are helping the Hebrew women give birth and you see the baby being born, so they've, seemingly taken look at the stones as see the baby being born right um and just by way of comparison the new king james says when you do the duties of a midwife for the hebrew women and see them on the birth stools uh -huh. birth stools yeah um so you see a variety okay how do we understand 
um, the, these stones, you know, I think it is a dual form. So these two stones, how do you understand this? Yeah. And of course, um, I remember looking at, you know, searching through commentaries, you know, you've got all these scholars who are interacting with these things and you've got all these lexicons and um, just to see the variety of solutions that are proposed, you know, does, does the stones mean testicles? Does it mean birth stool? <laughs> does it mean this? Does it mean that? Um, when I was working with uh, a team on Excess, when I was checking their translation, they came to me and they had actually left this part of the verse out because they were uncertain how to translate the word birth stool. They didn't uh -huh. know what a birth stool was. Uh -huh. They were really confused. And they said, well, we don't know what a birth stool is and we're, we're not sure why the versions differ here. Can you help us? It was yeah. one of those cases where they had just kind of given up and they said, well, we'll wait until we get this to the consultant and then we'll work on it there. So hmm. this was one of those places where I was very happy to, to have my BHS, my Hebrew Bible, and get it out and just kind of show them, okay, this says, look at the stones. And as soon as I said that, they said, oh, yes, of course. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> like, you mean, no, I, I said, no, 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 no. You know, in my mind, I'm thinking, there's no way you can understand this right away because, you know, so-and-so scholar who's written this commentary, all these different comments, all this scholarly ink that's been spilled on this, there's no way you can understand so quickly. You know, this is what I'm in my internal dialogue. Right. Uh, but they're saying, yeah, no, that makes Makes perfect sense. I said, well, what do you mean? And they said, well, you know, traditionally in our village, when women give birth, you get two stones to support uh -huh. the woman while that she sits on while she's giving birth. So the two stones are just the, the support that the woman, she either sits on or kind of understand either sits on or kind of pushes her feet against uh -huh. while she's giving birth. Okay. So for them, it made complete sense. I said, well, so do you guys have an idea of how you're going to translate birth stool now? And they said, well, no, we don't. No, we're gonna we're gonna say two stones. We're gonna say stones. <laughs> I said, well, are you guys sure? Are you sure that will make sense for your people? Are you sure you don't need to say something like when you see the baby being born? You know, all these sorts of games that we as consultants play. Like, are you really sure this is clear? Are you really sure this is gonna be good for your people? You know, like, and they're like, no, no, it makes sense. Like, we use stone. You know, traditionally we've used stones for women to give birth. So now in their translation of Exodus, there you go, stones. When you look at the stones and. Um, it's just one of those happy occurrences where, you know, all the commentaries in the world aren't going to help you because all they yeah. really needed to do was kind of get close to the Hebrew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. That's awesome. That's a great story. I'll have to keep that I in like, mind. Yeah. I like that one. And then um, I just have one more to kind of, uh, kind of round out this section. And that has to do, it's mm. from the New Testament this time. I hope that's okay. Yeah. To go New Testament, you don't mind? Okay. <laughs> um, it's in Luke nine forty six, And for okay. me, this passage, when I was checking Luke with a team, um, this passage and this kind of moment still stands out to me as an example of the way that we inadvertently read our culture into the Bible. So mm -hmm. what you might call eisegesis or mm -hmm. what you might call, I don't know what you want to call it, but reading ourselves in, or right. it's a great example of, um, you know, in cognitive linguistics, they, they talk about you, you kind of seek to understand something until you think you've understood and then you stop seeking to try to understand. Does that make sense? So yep. if you think if something, once something makes sense to you, you're not going to keep searching for more meaning. You're exactly. just going to say, oh yeah, I've understood. Right. Which so happens that's all what, the time with the book. Yes. Even if it, even if it's the wrong meaning or whatever, it doesn't matter. Once somebody thinks they've understood, you know, yep. they're, they're continuing on. So mm -hmm. that comes from, of course, relevance theory, if anybody's interested in kind of following mm -hmm. that or learning more about how that works. Um, yeah. So here in Luke 9, uh, 46, um, let me just see here. So what do the different, ver I've got some English ver versions open before me. So let's see here. So Christian Standard Bible, again, uh, a more contemporary, more recent English version says, an argument started among them about who is the greatest. So this is, of course, who? The disciples arguing about yeah. um, who's going to be the greatest, whatever. Um, but when you start comparing versions here, or when you look at the Greek word, which is diologismos, um, you see, okay, so English versions, I see dispute, argument, arguing, argument, disputation, um, mm -hmm. argument, 
um, argument, 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 argument. So most of them kind of tend towards argument, which yeah. I don't know in your dialect of English, Andrew, would you think an argument is kind of neutral or would you say it's kind of negative, negative. or a positive discuss negative discussion? Yeah. So maybe it's something that they shouldn't be. It's kind of negative. Maybe they shouldn't be talking about this. Right. Maybe they're getting into a fight. You know, they're, they're doing mm -hmm. the wrong thing here. Mm -hmm. Um, but dialogismos actually, I mean, it, another, so just think about the semantic range. I don't want to say it actually means something. I, I just need to be very careful here, but I'm yeah. um, thinking about the semantic range of dialogismos. Sometimes in different, in, in certain contexts, it just seems to mean, um, have a discussion. Yeah. Um, and so there are some versions that say a reasoning, um, where did I, I was looking at some ancient versions here. So just looking at what is it? Uh, the Coptic version says mm. a reasoning or a thought. So they mm. had a thought, they had a thought among them, which of them was to be the greatest. So um, to bring it back to my work as a consultant, I was checking this passage with the team and they had said something rather neutral, like a discussion. Oh. Um, and my kind of having all these different versions open before me and kind of looking, I think, uh, looking at BDAG on this passage as well, um, if I remember rightly, maybe BDAG even qualifies this as um, a dispute argument. Yeah, so BDAG gives the glosses of dispute argument, so which kind okay. of tends towards more kind of negative. Yeah. But then, of course, this is only one of three passages cited under that meaning in BDAG, so you got to take that with a grain of salt. But mm -hmm. I was, my instant reaction was, well, I see in most of the versions here people saying something kind of negative, like argument, argument, argument. Are you guys sure you shouldn't say something like that as well, given that most people say that? Yeah. Um, and they're like, well, no, we don't think it's necessarily something negative here. Um, and so it was at that time that I kind of took a step back and said, well, okay, am I as a consultant reading my culture into this, assuming that, hey, who's the greatest is automatically a negative discussion. Whereas right. they went on to explain to me that, hey, you know, if you've got to find a successor or if the situation is changing, mm. if, um, if things are being mixed up and you're yeah. losing a leader, uh, I mean, if Jesus is going away, then they've got to kind of work out, you know, you've got to size one another up as, uh -huh. you know, as funny as it might sound, you've got to figure out, okay, who's going to be the leader now? You know, if Jesus is going away, who's, who's going to? who's going to go out in front and who's going to lead us. So for yep. them, they saw it more of, Hey, they're reasoning. They're having mm -hmm. a thought They're They're discussing it. And it wasn't mm -hmm. necessarily negative. So they, I think we were both uh, guilty of reading our culture into it. Me having a reaction, seeing the version saying, no, it's got to be kind of negative as an argument and them saying it as more neutral. Yeah. Um, but I think what, what's beautiful about Bible translation and about what's, what's beautiful about doing Bible translation within with the church and in the context of the church is I think we all grow by having these sorts of discussions and learning from our brothers and sisters from different backgrounds, from different languages, different cultures, and exactly. getting, gaining a different perspective on the word and not necessarily insisting that, Hey, in this verse, you've got to cook the steak this way because that's how I like my steak. No, 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 no. Let's mm -hmm. take a look at the broad range. You know, where are the guardrails? How has this yep. been interpreted? Um, yeah. So that's just kind of the last example I wanted to end on. That's awesome because that's one of the things I hope people are going to get out of this podcast is that edifying view and perspective from other people in different parts of the world that they don't get, you know, especially the people we partner with in our little five minute presentations at our churches that they give us about our work. We don't get to share a lot of this stuff in depth. And so I think a lot of these people are, they're, they're investing in Bible translation very generously. And then they're missing out on gleaning some of this really good stuff. Mm. Like this might be part of the feast that we get in part mm. is part of Bible translation. Right. And yeah. And um, that's the kind of thing that I, I really want people to have access to and be able to enjoy rather than just hear these really vague and mm. general overviews of, oh, well, we got the, we did the, the dedication of this book or whatever, you know? Mm. So yeah, this is exciting, really exciting stuff for, for everyone to hear, including me. So thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Well, I want to be uh, sensitive to your time. So I know you're a family man, got uh, twins to 
to play with and whatnot. So, um, but I really want to do this again because it sounds like you probably have a lot more up your sleeve to share. Ah. And uh, <laughs> well, I feel like I feel like I need the longer I talk, the the more I feel like I need to give a disclaimer that. Um, you know, I still feel maybe it's this sort of imposter, uh, what do they call it? Imposter syndrome, but uh, <laughs> I still feel relatively new and inexperienced, um, in the domain of Bible translation, you know, especially compared to our colleagues who have worked in Bible translation for longer than I've been alive. Um, people right. for whom I have so much respect and look up to and right. admire them for their perseverance and the way that they've labored in this field. And so I fully suspect that, you know, in the coming years, my opinions may change as I gain experience and sure. dialogue. Um, but I just think it's wonderful to have these sorts of conversations and I'm fully prepared to be proved wrong or um, be shown a better way one day. So I just want to mm -hmm. give that little bit of disclaimer if I should be invited back or have to talk any longer. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it, uh, this is probably hopefully going to come out more and more on my, my podcast is that is definitely the stance that consultants and translation need to have. And, uh, you know, you, you've got to go in there being ready to say that you don't know or that mm -hmm. you were wrong. <laughs> Two very yes. important things, which I think yes. seminary taught me really well. I think that's one thing I'm thankful for. My time at Southern was the humbling effect of being around so many great professors and that slowly sinking in of how much you do not know and you probably mm. will never know. And eventually coming out of that saying, or recognizing the importance of being able to say just straight out, I don't know the answer. <laughs> mm. Instead of what most people in Christianity do who are leaders, they immediately, because they think they are a leader, have to just spout out something that sounds like an answer, even though mm. they don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I had asked Drew to share some relevant resources as we always do at the end of a podcast. And so this is time, this time it's his turn to share the stuff that he's found to be really valuable. Go ahead, Drew. Yes. Uh, this is a book by, uh, the first one is a book by David Brun called One Bible, Many Versions. Uh, the subtitle is Are All Translations Created Equal? Published mm. in 2013. This is a really helpful book for people who are interested in Bible translation. Um, mm. I think it's the sort of book that um, even if you're not really hardcore into biblical studies or Bible mm. translation or uh, translation studies, you could still get into. It's uh, written at a kind of popular level, and it gives a really nice perspective on um, why we have so many different versions of the Bible, and it helps to dispel some of the um, assumptions we have about certain versions. Like this version is is more is more literal, and literal right. is better, and this and this and this and this. So I find that book very helpful. Again, that's David Brun, uh, One Bible, Many Versions. Great. Um, and then after that, a book that's been helpful for me, again, coming back to the idea of gaining perspective on what we're trying to accomplish by working with Wycliffe and partnering with um, various organizations and working in the domain of Bible translation, a phenomenal book for gaining perspective on that work uh, for me has been a book called A New Vision for Missions, William Cameron Townsend the Wycliffe Bible Translators and the Culture of Early Evangelical Faith Missions, 1917 to 1945. How's that for a title? Whoa. Uh, that's, that's by William Svelmo, who is a professor of, um, what's he a professor of? Of history, um, religious history or something or other in America. That was published in 2008. Um, okay. A wonderful book for understanding how Wycliffe Bible translators and the Bible translation movement was birthed out of early evangelical faith missions. I find mm. it extremely helpful. So people who've invested in Wycliffe, who are familiar with Wycliffe, love Wycliffe, whether they're a member of Wycliffe or not, phenomenal book huh. um, for, gaining, for gaining some perspective on kind of how we got where we are. Is it on Kindle? I believe so. Yeah. Um, I looked okay. it up on Amazon a moment ago and I believe it Great. is. Yeah. It's a little bit pricey, but okay. uh, for me, it's a book I keep coming back to. That's really mm. stayed with me. Sweet. Um, 
lastly, the third book um, is actually a new translation of the Bible uh, called The Bible for Everyone. I cited it a couple times during the podcast. The Bible for Everyone is a new translation of the Bible by John Goldingay and Tom Wright. Those are names that won't be unfamiliar to people who dive deep into biblical studies. John mm-hmm. Goldingay on the Old Testament, Tom Wright on the New Testament. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a wonderful version. It's a wonderful way to try to gain a new appreciation for scripture, if that makes sense, Mm -hmm. Um, to kind of see it, it, to kind of read the Bible, read scripture in somewhat uh, new language or different language or a different approach to, so I I really enjoy um, reading that, um, the Bible for everyone. Yeah. Okay, sweet. Yeah. Thank you so much. Those are all books that I have not recommended yet. So that's perfect. Awesome. As always, thank you so much for listening. Here at Working for the Word, we believe that the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus. This podcast exists ultimately to help you treasure the Bible, go deeper into it, and become like the man of Psalm 1. 